Hi, I'd like to welcome you to our online bariatric seminar. My name is Rob Kenny. I'm the bariatric surgeon at Western Missouri Medical Center. The purpose of this seminar is to give you an overview of bariatric services and the services that we provide here at Western Missouri Medical Center. We go over the disease of morbid obesity. We'll talk a little bit about the procedures that we perform along with the risks and benefits of those procedures. And then we'll talk about the results of those procedures long term. If you'd like to come to an in-person seminar, we have an in-person seminar the third Tuesday of every month uh, in conference room one from six to seven o'clock. First, I would like to discuss our program's philosophy. Our philosophy is three points. The first point is the, that obesity is a chronic disease. A lot of patients have trouble with this their whole life, and bariatric surgery is not a cure. It is just a very powerful treatment. The second point is that maintenance of weight loss requires a comprehensive approach. Medicine, surgery, diet, and exercise all go into getting the best possible result over the longest term. And that here at Western Missouri Medical Center, we aim to treat obesity in a comprehensive manner with the highest level of quality. And we want both the surgical quality and the non-surgical quality to be the highest of anywhere. I put our contact information up here just to let you know that you can always call our office and ask questions throughout the process. A lot of questions can come up before surgery, after surgery, insurance questions, medical questions. Please feel free to call us at any time. We are a comprehensive program and there are a lot of people that go into making this program a success. Uh, there's myself, Sharon is our nurse in the operating room. Cheryl and Cindy are two nurses in the office who handle a lot of medical questions, check people into the office, those sorts of things. Travis is our registered dietitian. He works with patients both before and after surgery. Shauna is our exercise therapist. She also works with patients before and after surgery to put people on an exercise regimen that they are capable of doing. And Tina is our office manager. She handles a lot of the insurance verification questions. And this is just a partial list. There are certainly people all over the hospital who have gone through specialized training in order to make this program a success. So morbid obesity, that is the disease that we're treating with bariatric surgery. And how we define that is being greater than 100 pounds overweight or having a body mass index greater than 40. And we'll talk a little bit in the future about how to calculate body mass index. Also, a body mass index greater than 35 with one or more severe medical issues related to obesity, such as sleep apnea, hypertension, coronary artery disease, pulmonary disease, or diabetes. So how common is obesity? And what we found is that it's very common, especially in the United States and around where we live. This map is from the Centers for Disease Control, and it looks at the rate of adult reported obesity throughout the United States and you can even look back at previous years and watch how the colors change from more of the green to the yellow to more of the oranges and reds. You can even look at the same website and find information for our county, Johnson County, Missouri, and track it over the last decade and we can see an increase in the rate of adult obesity in the last decade. For example, in 2004 we had a 25.9% rate of adult obesity. In 2006 we had a 28.9% rate of adult obesity. And then in 2008, we had a 31% rate of adult obesity. So we could track that increase just over the last decade. So I talked about body mass index, and that's how we correct one's weight based on one's height. So in other words, if someone is 4 feet tall and they weigh 200 pounds, that's different than if they're 6 feet tall and they weigh 200 pounds. And how to calculate your body mass index, it's your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared, which is really pretty hard to calculate on a napkin. The easiest thing to do to calculate your BMI is to go into your search engine on your computer or on your phone and type in BMI calculator and something will come up where you can enter the numbers in using feet and inches and pounds. So the different BMI measurements, we've talked about some of them. Greater than 40 is morbid obesity. From 35 to 40 is severe obesity. If someone in this range has a medical issue related to obesity, that would classify as morbid obesity. 30 to 35 is obese, 25 to 30 is overweight, and 18 to 25 is in the normal or acceptable range. So what influences obesity? 
A lot of drug companies have put millions of dollars into trying to figure this out. Now, what we found is that it's extraordinarily complex. Genetics certainly plays a role. We've had many families and different generations come through our program. Behavior plays a role, and certainly environment plays a role. I work here in the hospital, and I go many different places in the hospital, from the operating room to the ward, up to the clinic, and it's always somebody's birthday, some holiday, something where we celebrate those occasions, and generally we do it with not the most healthy food. And I'm sure a lot of your places of work are similar. So we've defined obesity, but what are some of the medical effects of obesity? And this is a partial list. And really, if we would go into the hospital and see why different people are admitted to the hospital, a lot of them, while they're not admitted for a diagnosis of obesity, a lot are admitted for a complication of one of these diseases, such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, different respiratory diseases, sleep apnea, depression, urinary stress incontinence. We're seeing cancers are increasing uh, over time, and that's often related to obesity gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, degenerative joint disease or achy or pain in your joints, heart disease, gallstone, fatty liver disease. In fact, obesity is now the number one cause of liver failure requiring transplantation in the United States currently, coronary artery disease, stroke, and infertility. And again, that's just a partial list of the things that can occur from obesity. So, a lot of people may be saying, am I a candidate for bariatric surgery? And the criteria we use at Western Missouri Medical Center are the standard criteria set out throughout the country that are generally widely recognized. Our current criteria, our current criteria are having a BMI greater than 35 with a serious obesity-related comorbidity or other medical issue, such as obstructive sleep apnea, diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, history of stroke, anyone with a BMI greater than 40, regardless of other medical issues. And currently, we are only doing pa patients between the ages of 18 and 65. So I would like to switch gears a little bit and discuss the different procedures that we perform. We perform the two most common weight loss procedures in the United States. We do a laparoscopic gastric bypass and a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy and we'll go over each of those procedures as well as their risks and benefits. We recently stopped performing the laparoscopic adjustable gastric band or lap band procedure, and that is consistent with the different programs throughout the country as that procedure has become less popular. First, before we go through the different procedures, I would like to talk about the anatomy, the normal anatomy, so we can see how we change that with surgery. So, the food comes in the mouth, it goes down the esophagus, from there it goes into the stomach, from there the stomach can distend to store a large quantity of food. The stomach grinds up the food, turns it into a liquid, and then puts it out into the small intestines where most of the absorption of nutrients occurs. From there it goes into the colon, and then out. Before we talk about those other procedures, I'd like to talk about the gastric band. We did previously place uh, laparoscopic adjustable gastric bands. However, we started to place them with much less frequency over the last few years, and that was due to issues in terms of results and long-term complications requiring removal of the band. So really, we got to the point where we weren't placing any bands further, so uh, we just switched to the other two procedures. So we'll start by talking about a gastric bypass. This procedure, as well as the sleeve, are performed laparoscopically. That's with small incisions in the abdominal wall, where we put small instruments in and perform the procedure. This is the most frequently performed bariatric procedure at our facility and generally throughout the country. There is no implanted medical device, and it has a low rate of complications, although a little bit higher rate of early, more severe complications than the band. What we do is we make a small pouch of the stomach. We use a stapling device to divide the stomach. And then we divide the small intestines and bring the small intestines up to that piece of stomach. So then food goes down the esophagus into this small stomach pouch where it then bypasses most of the stomach and goes into the small intestines and then out. 
where we divided the small intestines gets re reconnected to the small intestine farther down and different fluid from the stomach flows into the small intestines through there. So unlike with the sleeve gastrectomy, we do not take anything out with a gastric bypass and the bypassed portion of the stomach stays in and is still healthy for a long term afterwards. These are the incision sites for a gastric bypass. Um, the small ones are around five millimeters and the larger ones are around one to one and a half inches and there's six of those incisions. And the pain between the two procedures is fairly similar and when you see the incisions are similar between the two procedures. Results of a gastric bypass. When we talk about results of any of these procedures, we talk about it in terms of excess weight loss as a percent. So in other words, if someone's ideal weight is 100 pounds and they weigh 200 pounds, they would have 100 pounds of excess weight. So if they would lose 50 pounds, they would have lost 50% of their excess weight. If they would lose 100 pounds, they would lose 100% of their excess weight. So for a gastric bypass, we typically see excess weight loss of around 65 to 80%. Since we do rearrange the gastrointestinal tract, that does affect some of the absorption of vitamins and minerals. So this does require taking a bariatric specific multivitamin regimen daily, and that is for life. Follow-up is around every three months for the first year after surgery, and then eventually it trails off where we see patients every year. And our goal is to see patients for life after this surgery. Complications of a gastric bypass. Whenever we talk about any of these procedures, I do want everyone to know all the good things that can happen and the not so good things. So I do go over a long list of complications, which frequently do not occur. Uh, and if they do occur, lots of times we can treat them and people can have good success afterwards. With a gastric bypass, I do think the easiest thing is to look at a picture. So one of the most worrisome complications is anywhere where we divide the intestinal tract that can leak intestinal contents if, that would, if there would be a hole in those connections. And that's called a leak and that can cause people to require other surgery uh, or other procedures and that can also cause people to have infection and get fairly sick and be in the hospital for a prolonged period of time. Another complication is this operation does put people at risk of ulcers and people can develop ulcers. Those ulcers can eventually scar down the connection between the stomach pouch and the small intestines, and that can require a balloon procedure to treat. And then here, where we have the small intestines connected to themselves, there's a little space. Well, intestines can twist around that space, and that's called an internal hernia, and that can occasionally require other procedures or other surgery to fix. Mortality after a gastric bypass is around 0.5% at 30 days. To put that in per some perspective, uh, they've taken groups of patients with BMIs greater than 40. One group had surgery, one group didn't have surgery. They matched the two groups. And what they found is that one year, both groups had a mortality of 0.5%. The mortality in the group that didn't have surgery was generally due to a complication of obesity. The mortality in the group that had surgery was often due to the surgery. Hopefully that number, hopefully that puts that, that number in a little bit of perspective for you. Risk of leaks from the staple line, which we talked about, are, are around 0.5 to 1%. Again, risk of ulcers, internal hernia, dumping syndrome. And what dumping syndrome is, <clears throat> some patients that have that drink sugary things like a milkshake, that milkshake will go from the pouch directly into the small intestines. And the small intestines aren't used to getting that much sugar at one time. And that can cause an unpleasant um, set of symptoms, including vomiting, nausea, weakness, sweating, diarrhea. People just don't feel good. And lots of times that lasts around 30 minutes to an hour, and typically it resolves. So while it's listed as a complication, a lot of patients like it if they get a little bit of dumping because it trains them not to have those high sugary type foods. And last on here, it's pretty common for us to put a camera down in the stomach and look around at the stomach through the mouth. But since part of the stomach is bypassed, it's more difficult to do that. And we would have to do a long, uh, small surgery to put the camera in that bypassed portion of the stomach. So we'll switch gears a little bit and we'll talk about the sleeve gastrectomy. This procedure is also performed laparoscopically. 
It is the second most frequently performed bariatric procedure. Again, there is no implanted medical device. And what we do during surgery, while patients are asleep, a calibration tube is placed into the stomach, and then we divide the stomach and remove approximately 80% of the stomach. And the reason this works is the portion of the stomach we remove is the portion of the stomach that stretches to accommodate a large meal. These are the incision sites for a sleeve gastrectomy. Again, you can see the big one on the right side and that's where we remove the stomach. And that incision is usually around one and a half to two inches. Results of a sleeve gastrectomy. Excess weight loss of around 55 to 65%. Patients do have to take a bariatric multivitamin regimen afterwards for life. Follow-up is the same for gastric bypass, and this can be converted into a gastric bypass or a duodenal switch in the future if that would be needed. Complications of a sleeve gastrectomy. Again, I always think it's easiest to look at a picture. And again, anywhere where we divide the intestinal tract, that can leak. So just like for a gastric bypass, a sleeve gastrectomy can have leaks and those can require other procedures or other surgeries to treat. Also, when you look at the sleeve, after that stomach has been divided, it looks like a backwards L. Kind of where that L shape forms, people can get an intermittent obstruction in the stomach, and that is fairly rare, and that can occasionally require either dilation or other surgery to treat. Other complications of a sleeve gastrectomy, Mortality of around 0.5%, so about the same as for a gastric bypass. And then we talked about obstruction of the stomach. And occasionally there can be dilation of the top portion of the stomach over time, and that can cause heartburn or nausea, and sometimes that can require other surgery to treat, although that complication is fairly rare. Other risks of bariatric surgery or abdominal surgery in, in general, uh, abdominal wall hernias, chest pain, Rarely people would see a collapsed lung, constipation, diarrhea, and a lot of people will ask how these different procedures will affect their bowel habits. And for the most part, people's bowel habits don't change a lot after the surgery. However, we do put people on a high protein diet and that can be constipated. So more often uh, than diarrhea, people will say they have a little bit more constipation and sometimes have to take a stool softener every day. Dehydration, gallstones, with weight loss, it is common to get gallstones, so, so around 20% of patients who have had their gallbladder removed, who have not had their gallbladder removed, who have had the surgery will end up needing their gallbladder removed in the future from gallstones. Inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract, obstructions in the intestinal tract, stretching of the stomach, needing a surgical procedure repeated, and then nausea and vomiting. And when people ask, I usually tell them that nausea is the most common side effect that they'll see the first few days to a week after surgery. And we treat that very aggressively and send people home with nausea medicine. Other risks of surgery and anesthesia, bleeding, pain. Some people get some left-sided shoulder pain and that's from the air we use to inflate the abdominal cavity can irritate the shoulder. That usually goes away in around 24 hours. Risk of pneumonia different complications of anesthesia and medications. A deep vein thrombosis is a blood clot in the deep veins of the legs. If that breaks off, that can cause a pulmonary embolism. That is very rare, but it is one of the more common causes of death after the surgery. For that reason, we do give patients blood thinners before and after the surgery and get patients up and walking the day of surgery. So we do go over a long list of complications and they do occur that being said, the vast majority of the patients don't have any, and the ones that do, lots of times we can treat those and people do well in the long term. So we'll switch gears again a little bit. Uh, we talked about the weight-related effects of the different procedures, but what about the other medical issues that we talked about related to obesity? First, we'll talk about type 2 diabetes. What we find is that this is very well treated with a gastric bypass. We see remission in around 80% of those patients with significant prove improvement in an additional 10%. And what's interesting is this is a pretty immediate change that occurs during their hospital stay. Usually around 24 hours, people's blood sugars track down to normal fairly quickly. And we think this is an effect based on changes in the uh, hormones in the gastrointestinal tract from the surgery. 
Diabetes was improved with a gastric band, but more related to weight loss. And a sleeve gastrectomy, it's kind of the middle procedure between the two. So we do see some immediate effect with a sleeve gastrectomy, and then more improvement with diabetes with time as weight is lost. So here are different medical issues. Hypertension, 79% resolved or improved. Sleep apnea, which is very common in patients with obesity. We see that is 84% resolved or improved. And then cholesterol is often improved, but not to the extent to some of the other, as some of the other medical issues. This is the one slide summary of everything. This goes over all the different procedures, along with their weight loss um, and other variables. We can see here a gastric bypass has an excess weight loss of 65 to 80%. Gastric banding, which again we do not perform anymore, but that had an excess weight loss of 45 to 55%. And then a sleeve gastrectomy is right in the middle of those two with an excess weight loss of 55 to 65%. Gastric bypass in terms of other medical issues, that would be the top one because of its effect on diabetes. And then a sleeve gastrectomy and then a band. A gastric bypass and a sleeve gastrectomy both require a daily multivitamin that's bariatric type specific. And then reversibility. A gastric bypass, again, we do not take anything out, so it is technically possible to reverse. A sleeve gastrectomy is irreversible. Once we take the stomach out, we can't give it back. Usual hospital stay. After a laparoscopic gastric bypass, the usual hospital stay is two days. So if someone had the surgery on a Monday, they would go home on a Wednesday. Sleeve gastrectomy, typically people go home the next day, although occasionally they do stay two days. So a lot of people will say, which procedure is best for me? And really this decision has to be tailored to each individual person and their eating habits. That being said, generally diabetics, especially if they're on insulin, we do recommend a gastric bypass because of the improvement in diabetes. And also patients with a higher BMI, we re generally recommend either a gastric bypass or a sleeve gastrectomy. And this is what we discuss in detail in the clinic appointments. We've gone over a lot about the different operative procedures for weight loss, but the secrets to success, surgery, diet, exercise, and continuing to follow up with us. So we still have patients see the dietitian and exercise therapist both before and after surgery. And we do think it's important that patients continue to follow up with us or with another bariatric program if they move. Bariatric surgery is a tool for weight loss. It's a very powerful tool, but I think it's important that patients take credit for their success. They're the ones that came to the seminar or viewed the seminar online. They're the ones that followed all the instructions and uh, did the preoperative diet and did all the exercise. So I think it's important patients take credit for their own success. A quick word on smoking. Smoking can cause issues with ulcers for gastric bypass patients. So we do require smokers to stop uh, before any weight loss surgery. Alcohol. A gastric bypass does speed the absorption of alcohol, just like the sugary drink we talked about earlier causing the dumping syndrome. Alcohol can be absorbed quicker, so the effects of alcohol come quicker and the effects are magnified after a gastric bypass and to a lesser extent a sleeve gastrectomy. So generally we recommend abstaining from alcohol after a bypass or sleeve gastrectomy, although in a social situation uh, half a drink or so can be okay. Why have your surgery at Western Missouri Medical Center? We have the expertise to offer all of the commonly performed weight loss procedures so you can choose the procedure that fits you the best. We are a comprehensive program and we want patients to see the dietitian, exercise therapist and we do want patients to keep coming back for life afterwards. And it's really easier to maintain follow-up with a program that's closer to home. The experience at our facility, currently we have performed greater than 200 bariatric procedures over the last five years and I have performed greater than 300 stapled weight loss procedures. We are an accredited center. We are accredited uh, by the Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery Accreditation and Quality Improvement Program. And what that means is that accrediting body came to our hospital, looked at our facilities, looked at our charts, and then going forward, patients are anonymously placed in a database along with their results. And that quality improvement program can monitor our results and 
and make sure that we are meeting our benchmarks. We do have support groups for bariatric surgery. Those support groups meet in Conference Room 1 at Western Missouri Medical Center. They meet on the third Tuesday of every month from 7 to 8 o'clock at night. We go over a variety of topics through the years. Anyone is welcome to attend any patients before surgery, after surgery, or support of people going through surgery. Some of our different policies, all patients must be between the ages of 18 to 65 at the time of surgery. Our BMI must be less than 55 for males and less than 60 for females at the time of surgery. And most patients can easily diet down to these levels if they are a little bit above them. And we work with patients to get them to those levels. And at this time, we're not doing any major revisions. If patients had a stomach stapling in the 80s, we're not revising those types of procedures. How to begin the process. The first step is to view the seminar, which you've done. Then if you'd like, you can call our office to make an appointment to meet us in the clinic. From there, what we'll do is we'll contact your insurance company regarding your benefits regarding weight loss surgery. We'll obtain whatever necessary documentation we need from your primary care or specialty offices. We'll have you get a sleep study if we think that's appropriate. All patients are required to get a psychological evaluation. And then if we think you need either cardiology or pulmonary consultations, we can get those set up as well. Then, if your insurance company requires a medically supervised diet, typically three to six months, we work with you to complete that. Once that process is finished, we send all that information off to your insurance company to get prior authorization. Once it's authorized, we can schedule the surgery. There is a two-week all-liquid diet before the surgery to shrink the size of the liver and to decrease surgical complications. And then you have your surgery, and on you go. Again, thank you very much for viewing our seminar. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. If you'd like to call our clinic to schedule an appointment or ask a question, feel free to call us at 660-747-5558. And again, if you would like to view the seminar in person, our seminar is the third Tuesday of every month from 6 to 7 o'clock in Conference Room 1 at Western Missouri Medical Center. Thank you.